Thank you so much. Uh, let me just say a few words today about what I think is important for all designers and architects. It's the language of architecture. And I'm particularly thinking today about the death of Oscar Niemeyer, one of the great architects who died yesterday at the age of 104. Uh, he was an amazing person because as an architect, he believed that architecture did have a language and the language was not about itself, but was about communicating something about society, about freedom, about the possibilities of what architectural expression can do for a city. Look at Brasilia. And uh, I believe that he was one of the few architects of our time that represented both the formal idea that architecture is a form of space, but also a social and political idea that architecture is more than just a game of geometries. And that brings me to a few categories which I have for you that I'm interested in. Hand. Uh, one of the things I love about uh, Niemeyer's work is that he generated his architecture from drawings, as I do. And I think in an age of uh, telecommunications, of all sorts of possibilities, uh, drawing uh, tends to disappear into technology. But I'm a great believer that a drawing is something important, it's something spiritual. And even when I made these drawings many years ago without any commissions, my thought was to explore the language of architecture, the language of the city, drawings which really generate the idea of space themselves. And I continue to draw, and not necessarily figurative drawings for buildings, but exploring the very nature of drawing for the sake of communicating what architecture can do and how architecture can develop. That certainly is true for also building. When, when, when I'm working on any project, no matter what its scale, I develop all my projects from drawing. Of course, we have many computers, many sophisticated tools that enhance and make possible a construction of buildings. But I think there is nothing to replace, in my own view, and this is a personal view, the connection between the hand, the heart, the soul, and the mind. And I think what Oscar Niemeyer was, was primarily a poet just the way the great architects of the 20th century were. Mies van der Rohe, Le Corbusier, they were poets, first of all. Second of all, they used architecture as a language to communicate their poetry. And of course, that is, to me, really the Renaissance idea of architecture, which is, in a way, eternal. The drawing, the world of humanities, the world of ideas, the world of poetry is the world of design. It's not the world of technology, the world of infrastructure, the world of statistics, the world of science. Of course, there are many scientific aspects we have to know as designers, and we have to study the brain and the cellular structure of, of the DNA, but primarily, we are in a humanistic world, in a world that continues to generate spatial ideas, architectural ideas, and that's certainly one of my notions of how to develop a work. Now, of course, the language of architecture can express things. Uh, it's not uh, just some sort of a style. Think of uh, the word espresso. Espresso, coffee, means that you don't get the water. You get the essence of the coffee strongly. That is what I believe uh, expressive means. And I had a chance to design a house, Medford, Connecticut, near New York. Uh, you know, a house can be anything. A house you know, can have any form. It's one of the most individualized forms uh, that we really have, a house itself. But what is a house that has never existed before? How do you express a client's uh, idea of a house? What do you do to create a house really of the 21st century whose sense of space, whose sense of material is not that of a 20th century house? And my clients who are both uh, famous auctioneers of art, uh, ask me to do a house where they don't want to have any work of art in their house. So they said, Mr. Liebeskind, we want the house itself to inspire us. And so the house is, is a house which is, stands on an empty piece of beautiful land in Connecticut. Uh, the material of the house is stainless steel. It's completely folded stainless steel. Uh, inside of the house, however, uh, there is a very different sense of space. And the house, of course, you see its proximity to the trees you see the, the fact that stainless steel can also reflect. It has very different colors. Sometimes it's just light blue or green. It's like a sharp, reflective object. 
that actually comes into the house itself. So the structure of the house, which is a form which is folded in a very complex way, small footprint, but a grand variety of spaces as you saw from the plan. And of course, the interior of the house is completely you know, a thick oak wood, very, very thick, several inches, six, seven inches, thick oak wood, so kind of like a cave. It has six, uh, four different uh, porches. It was a house where I was able to design everything from the fixtures to the lights, to the furniture, to, the, to all the things that, that my clients needed uh, uh, to have. And uh, I think, uh, what the house is, 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 it's a different sense of a house. It's not a house which is a glass house, which is a glass window view, but a kind of a shaped space that gives preference depending where you are. You're looking towards the bedroom, which closes with a short door, and it becomes more like a cave. The kitchen, the, it's a flowing space. There are not too many walls in the house, but of course it is very, very functional and uh, very well thought out in terms of where it's situated, what it is doing. And by the way, during uh, Sandy, the last storm, uh, where so many houses were, were damaged, I was happy to, to, to find out that not a single drop of water uh, came into this house. And by the way, we become very good friends with our clients who actually invited us, my, myself and Nina, to stay in the house whenever they are not there. And I did stay once, and I have to tell you, it really, a house is really more about the atmosphere. It's about how a house changes your way of looking at the world. It's not just one more functional container for your activities, but how you can change the way you sleep, the way you wake up in the morning, the way you see the world in the morning and in the evening. And of course, it is a very sustainable form, as you can see. There's not too much glass. It's self-shading. And this brings me to a next uh, thought. Uh, heritage is a word that is, that is important. Uh, often often uh, misused. I had a chance, uh, you know, for a long time I did not build in China, but I met an amazing uh, man, my client, Mr. Wang Shi, from the China Vanka Corporation, uh, who, whose ethics and whose idea of architecture appealed to me. And he asked me if I would design something very unique, which is the first public-private museum, but it's first privately funded museum of history for the public of China. Something very special. It's not a government uh, a story of, 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 of history, but it is really a story told in a new way about Zhang Zhidang, who probably you know, one of the great visionaries of China in the 19th century, who laid the foundations for steelworks and modernization of China. And of course, it's about Wuhan. It's in Wuhan, which is really the center of the steel industry. Just some early sketches, uh, how to create a, a shape, a building, a function, which really brings together this amazing visionary Zhang Zhidang, who really invented uh, really the whole idea of the city. He invented the idea of how to modernize industry by setting steelworks of China, by producing first connections to all the railways of China, producing weaponry, producing machinery. An amazing, inspiring person, of course, during the Shanghai Revolution, October uh, 1910, which really brought China into the modern world in a very powerful way on the Yangtze River. The site itself is historical. It's part of the heritage. and so. The idea of creating a, a narrative that connects Zhang Zhidang, one floor, the industry, the idea of industry, and the idea of Wuhan from a kind of center of the world here and how it expands through the gardens of the building. And of course, Wuhan is an important center of, uh, and history and the future are really literally inscribed in the site. There is uh, the early model, two large uh, cores that lift this uh, spherical form a part of a sphere, uh, and, and these, these uh, large industrial silos contain circulation and offices and so on, and they lift upwards the actual building. And the building, of course, sits in a space which creates a garden, uh, preserves some of the buildings of the steel mills, but creates a new area for living, and I think will become a very attractive place in this very vital city. Uh, how is it made? Well, it is uh, Vanka, China Vanka Steel Corporation. So it is a steel building with a steel facade, steel structure. At the very top, there is the lounge from which you can see from that apex of that sphere that has many connotations because it's related to shipbuilding, to ships. It's related to roof constructions of ancient uh, Chinese architecture. It's related to many things that you see from that site in terms of industry. 
And then, of course, you can see uh, the city exhibition. Below it is the industry exhibition and the Jean Jedang as a foundation of this theater of Wuhan. Uh, here is a rendering of the Jean Jedang and Modern Industrial Museum. So the form is, is elevated, it's, it's, it's crystalline, it's curved, curvilinear, it's reflective. It is really like a gateway to a new neighborhood. And uh, you can see through the steel construction that is really about steel, using the steel to create this building that hovers up above, creates vistas uh, via the site, creates a, a very special garden of history in which you can see the industrial artifacts distributed around it. And basically, you can also view, as you are in the museum, looking at Jean Giudin's contribution at the industry and Wuhan, the city rising out of its own foundations. So it is a theater in which the windows open, uh, the stage opens, people can interact with both exhibits and the industrial heritage of the site. And it will be, I think, a very, very dramatic building uh, with, with its own topography and yet very, very closely linked to the magic of what Jean Jedank was able to do uh, and how powerful his vision was to really bring China into the 21st century, create a place for meetings, uh, for exhibitions, for interaction, for knowledge, and finally, a building that in itself has the mission to be well built. Uh, so many buildings in China, but to build a building that is truly uh, sustainable in every way, where the materials are good, where it's, where it's really built to last. That is also uh, Mr. Wang Shi's wish and certainly uh, our challenge to build a building that doesn't just look good in a photograph, but in 20, 30, 50, 75 years is a building that still shines with the spirit of Zhang Zhidang, spirit of the people of Wuhan. Sculpture is a word that has always interested me. And as the great uh, theorist and an artist, Marcel Duchamp, said, uh, what is architecture? It's simply a sculpture with plumbing. Uh, yes, even a cube is a conceptual piece of art with a bit of infrastructure. But when it comes to high density residential developments, how can one create an individuality? How can one create a world which we expect from, the, from a small house to be individual, but at high density where prices of land are very high, where the real estate values are very high, where everybody wants to pack as many square meters as possible, how can you create individuality? That's to me the greatest challenge and I had a good fortune to work with Capital Corp in Singapore to create this high density residential development on the former uh, sort of locks and, and, and canals that are industrial and create really a place that every individual in this uh, new neighborhood has a very unique space, a very unique building, a very unique view, a very unique place to live. You can see how dense it is and you can see to the right the Caribbean development, very different, more stamped out and more uh, rationalized geometry, whereas here on the left you can see the villas, which go from about seven stories to 15 stories, uh, marking a boulevard and green spaces in this strip of land, and the six double towers, which raise themselves far above the horizon. Uh, it is a gateway to Mount Faber. It is a gateway to the entirely new neighborhood, which is uh, uh, this neighborhood in Singapore. And yet, being a residential quarter, it has the intimacy and also something else, something that I think has never been done before, that in a high-rise building, every position of every floor is in a different spatial sense. So no one is exactly above or below their neighbor. And I think that's an important, not just a metaphor, but you really feel it. When you're in those units, you really feel a kind of freedom that gives you a sense of privacy, a sense of individuality. Of course, there are many, many different uh, clubhouses, cafes, places for people on the boardwalk, entertainment. Uh, so it is a community, a high density community. And uh, it is a place, I think, where the sculptural idea of a building or of a neighborhood is not a metaphor for a single gesture, but shapes truly every single part of the space. And it is a beautiful piece of land. I try to preserve as much green space as possible, given how dense the project is. And you can see that there's 
uh, a lot of space still to be able to enjoy these doubly curved towers and uh, to, to see those large-scale gardens that rise above and connect the towers. Those are all public spaces, including the top penthouse uh, sort of gardens at the very top. So reflections at Keppel Bay is not just a, a metaphor, but really an attempt to create a sculpturally individualized environment where every single person is not in a cookie cutter place, but has, without the marketing hype, truly a unique view of the place. Well, dialogue, I think you've heard a little bit about one of my favorite projects, which is here in Hong Kong, the creative center, the Run Run Shaw media building. And, and again, the challenge there was, this is a public building. It's like any other school in Hong Kong. It's not more expensive. It's just per square meter, exactly the same cost. How do you do something which would give the scale of people the, the right intimate environment without banalizing the idea of education? This is a building that has so many functions, so many, uh, so many different faculties, and so many interesting creative people working here. So developing it through large-scale models where really one can study what the proportions are, what's, where light is. In this section, uh, one can see that there are uh, multi-purpose spaces. There are the large sound stages. There are performance spaces. There are laboratories. There are sound studios. It's, it's packed. It's really packed with program. Um, more than 2,000 students, 500 members of faculty. So how do you create a building that has the energy of what is in it, not only inwardly, but outwardly, and, and to bring that unpredictable sense of light, of views, beautiful views from Kowloon all the way to the harbor, create places where people can interact around uh, new possibilities of discourse and create really an intimacy and a functional unity to a building which has so many programs, has so much to do on this uh, interesting tight site where a mountain really stood. And I think the Creative Media Center uh, to me, it is really a realization that without decoration, without expensive facades, without the rhetoric of, uh, of fun, one can create truly, out of concrete, plastic spaces that are radical, that, that can, uh, with strong forces, bring people together, give people new ideas, stabilize and destabilize the mind in new ways, and that's, of course, part of the Run Run Show Center. Diversity is, is another concept that I'm always very interested in, especially when it comes to a city. Uh, I had a chance to design a master plan and some buildings in, in Seoul, the center of Seoul, Korea. Here is the site, the Yongsan Project. Vinny Mas is actually one of the architects uh, working with me there. But as a master planner, what do you do? You're in the middle of a 600-year-old city with a great history, right in the center of the city, on the Han River, Nam Mountains right in the back. You see that housing built in the 60s and 70s blocking the riverfront. How do you take this railway land, uh, there's the Yongsan Station, the big hub, and create really a completely 21st century city while taking in the, the history of the site, which is unique? So there is just uh, the notion of this archipelago that I've created which you can see picks up the geometries, not in a very obvious way, weaves them into a series of neighborhoods connected by green. And I was inspired by the Shilla crown, one of the great items of the Korean culture, because Shilla dynasty, which lasted for such a long time, lasted because it has cultural aspirations, not only political and economic aspirations, but cultural aspirations, music, poetry, literature, maintenance of records was a key to the Shilla crown, and that's what I attempted to bring to this site, create a crown, since this is a very dense site, it will have about 30 of the world's tallest skyscrapers, just to give you the, the, the scale, 30 skyscrapers. So it's not just uh, some streets with taller buildings, it's 30 skyscrapers, a new business center, a new cultural center, a new uh, residential space, uh, a, a huge retail valley, all connected. So the logic, the logic, well, one would like to impose an idealized grid on a city. Everybody looks at New York, where I come from. Perfect, the grid works perfectly, but how do you do it? How do you do it with, with the history and the genius loci of the site? 
when you know that it's already disrupted, that idealized grid and its geometries are disrupted by forces which are on the site, and of course you can take advantage of those forces by bringing them together into a new constellation, by creating a set of neighborhoods connected by retail, connected by green space, and yet having each their own identity and their own sense of scale. So there it is. There's the business district, the, the fashion district, luxury residence, the park, the waterfront made accessible. And there it is in, in, a, in, a, in a seemingly magical proposition just unfolded. But please know that this project has been worked by thousands of people for, for many, many years. But there it is, uh, opening uh, the river, giving the waterfront back to the public, and creating the kind of relationships that tall buildings normally don't have, because they originated in Chicago with taller and taller buildings on a street. But we are, have a different situation in a high-density city. We are not building just taller buildings. We're building skyscrapers to make the city sustainable. So how does one create space and a possibility of orientation view sustainability for a piece of land given that each of these buildings is very, very tall, very, very large. I work, we always work with physical models and you can get a sense of the complexity that you have to carve the site vertically deep so you can bring light to all the retail levels which are really one of the largest retail developments in Asia and at the same time bring the character of the narrow alleyways, the narrow streets that are so beautiful in old Seoul and that gives so much expression to the culture of Korea, of Seoul, and at the same time, of course, have fantastic tall buildings that really can cope with the demands of the program. Uh, this is uh, my own uh, uh, high-rise office tower, which is uh, a very new kind of idea of, of what an office tower. And by the way, where you saw the social housing, this is a cost per square meter for the social housing. This is not uh, housing for the rich. It's taking the per square meter price exactly of those big block buildings and giving the people who live there, I think, very high density but interesting apartments that have flexibility, that have no columns uh, in the structure, that, that have no unobstructed views, and are exactly on cost in terms of profitability. So there it is. Uh, there are, as I said, Winnie Master is one of the architects, Renzo Piano, many uh, of my colleagues and friends are architects on this project. I think it is a new undertaking, a very bold one, and really redefines diversity itself. Well, rebirth, let me take you back to New York City, where 11 years ago the attacks happened, but time has moved on. It's no longer just about the memorial, about the memory. It's now about the rebirth of Lower Manhattan. And I think that's true for all cities. All cities need to be reborn because it's no longer a competition between nations. It's not only a competition between cities, it's even a competition between sectors of cities. In New York, Chelsea, Eastside, Brooklyn, uh, comp competing within themselves. I think that will be further so in an open and democratic world. And when I really started this project, uh, as you know, it was very controversial. It was not easy to, to, to survive under the tremendous pressure of politics, emotions in New York. But at the same time, the project which I presented in sketch form, in models, in ideas, to bring back New York by creating really civic spaces. Of course, there are beautiful towers, but my interest was public spaces. I live in Lower Manhattan, I work in Lower Manhattan. It's a place that has very little public space. It's usually dark alleyways of Wall Street. So how does one give, through the memorial, through the, through the memory of those who perished, a new public space, which really is about half of the site. There are 16 acres on the site. Eight acres are public space, which is a lot more than the Port Authority or the government ever intended. But you can see the sense of it. You can see in the master plan the openness to Hudson River. You can see that below the buildings, there is some of the largest infrastructure in the world, which has to be built at once. All of it is built. It's, 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 it's the infrastructure for transportation, the path trains, the subways, which continue running, the foundations of the towers themselves. Of course, the slurry wall, uh, such an important element of the site, which is now part of the museum experience. The museum will open next year. Uh, and will become, I think, a major, major new understanding of what that site means for New York and how from the bedrock of tragedy can rise the notion of a city of liberty, of fullness, of enjoyment, of diversity. Uh, the, the memorial has opened. 
Uh, and uh, I have to tell you that when I first proposed uh, the waterfalls, which of course are in Michael Arad's memorial design, uh, most of the newspapers in New York or television station said it was the craziest idea that, you know, it's a Libeskin proposal in Niagara Falls in New York. What a, what a stupid idea. But it is not stupid. People enjoy the waterfalls. They screen the sound of the busy streets of New York. They give intimacy to the side, a kind of privacy, bring nature to the hardscape of New York. And all I have to tell you is that in the one year since the memorial has opened, more than five million people have visited. Five million people have visited the memorial, and it's not very easy to visit it because you get to have to get tickets. It's still a construction site. It's not fully accessible. So when the site is truly no longer a, bu a building site, this certainly will become, in my view, one of the most interesting places in New York. And I have to tell you that there are more than three times the number of people living in Lower Manhattan today than before 2001, which is really a rebirth of a neighborhood, a rebirth of a city. I proposed an extra space the Wedge of Light, which is a, a, a piazza almost of the size of San Marco in Venice, which certainly was not in the Port Authority on government plans because I thought there should be an entrance from the Broadway side, and that's really an important marker of the times of the attack shaped in between 846 and 1028 of that fateful day. The buildings stand in a grid, uh, but you can see that they are, even though they stand in the grid of Lower Manhattan, they are slightly torqued to resemble and to echo in the periphery the torch of liberty, which is just to the south of the site. I think that's an important message that this is also a symbolic site. It's not just business as usual, not just some more gleaming uh, skyscrapers. It marks the site of memory. It marks an important new public space. And I think the skyline is pretty soon going to emerge. It's pretty much Tower One, Freedom Tower, 1776 tall. Tower number four is almost finished. Tower number three is under construction. Tower number two has not yet started, but very, very close to the actual drawings, to the plans, and part of the notion that this project is important not only through rebuilding, but to the rebirth after such a tragedy. Of course, the work is ongoing. There are thousands of workmen on the site. It's always a challenge. Building in New York City is in such a tight site, even just to bring steel members you know, we, we live very close, we work very close, we hear the trucks at, you know, all night long, and it's not a, not a sound sleep, but it's a good sleep, because we know that sooner or later, Ground Zero will be a living memorial to the rebirth. And I always end with this uh, image, which I began. You know, I was an immigrant. I grew up in Poland under a communist uh, dictatorship. I was 11 years old. I knew uh, how, how my parents had to hide themselves because of their beliefs. I knew that it was illegal to listen to the radio, to the BBC, because my parents were not members of the Communist Party. They were not fellow travelers. They were free people. And yet, that's what I think New York is about. New York is about immigrants. It's about people of New York. It's about the fact that it is a city of liberty, a city of freedom. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing all this experience and uh, very fascinating to know your recent works also in Asia and I'm sure our audience have a lot of things to ask you. Okay. So questions from the floor, please. Yes, please, the mic over there. Yes, please stand up. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, hello. I'd like to um, ask you more about uh, your thoughts on context. Because a lot of your I guess more previous buildings relate are, are very contextual. Um, not so much con contextual, you know, like the relationship with the site or surrounding, but more in terms of the memory, the history, the culture, such as the museum in uh, Berlin, in Toronto, or the projects in the, the, the World Trade Center, even as, as a whole master plan. How do you see um, these new kind of developments, like in Seoul or in Singapore? In, relates to the context, but not so much in terms of you know, the surround, but the, the spatial quality that you had created through your other uh, previous projects. Uh, second quick question is your th thoughts on the rebirth of Hong Kong. <laughs> uh, well, let me start with the latter question first. Hong Kong is, of course, everybody's, it's on everybody's top five cities in the world. 
I think every architect designer will tell you Hong Kong would be on that, on that list because of the people of Hong Kong, because of the diversity, the, the ambition, the, the daring in many ways of a city like Hong Kong has been there through history. And uh, I, I do love Hong Kong and I, and I see new developments and I also see new challenges with more density, becoming more uh, part of the region. It, it of, of course needs to do many, many more things than it has done in the past, but I'm sure that the city will always be ahead of all the other cities because of the ingenuity and the ambition of its designers, uh, its people, sometimes its politicians. Uh, now, to ask, uh, answer your first question, you know, context to me is not just the visible. We often talk about the visible context, but that's the least, you know, that's the least of the context that there is. Most of the context is not seen. Most of the context is hidden, sometimes invisible, sometimes actually it's repressed in the consciousness. Sometimes it's obliterated from history. So context is not just something you can find on a map on the Google world. It's something that one has to delve, a kind of a probe into the unknown to figure out what the context is. Of course, when you talk about Singapore and Seoul, two very different societies, very different histories, very different cities, I can't generalize. But in each one of those cases, uh, in each of those programs, I tried to put a probe into, uh, into kind of the, the, the history of a place. Of course, not every city is like Berlin, and not every city uh, is New York. Not every city has the same tension in the context. But I think every city deserves to address it, and it's not always easy. Uh, often it's very controversial because things come out of the context that nobody ever wanted to see. But I think that's part of the beauty of a place like Brasilia by Oscar Niemeyer, who in the middle of the jungle created a utopia. And even a failed utopia is better than no utopia at all. Yes, the mic over there, please. Yes. Uh, hi, Tony. Uh, first of all, I want to uh, congratulations on the uh, new Academy of uh, Jewish Museum uh, last month. Thank and you. I have two Thank questions. Uh, one is, uh, you know, I know you, uh, you, you, you was playing the accordion uh, when, you was, when you were young, and you played along, I think, with Isaac when you were 13, when he was 14, and because I played accordion when I was young as well. I really want to know how accordion and violin work together. And uh, I, don't know, I don't know whether like, you could still remember like, what it was like that time. And that was my first question. My second question is, uh, I think you have a very unique uh, design language. No matter people call it you know, neo brutalism or you know, deconstructionism or whatever. But uh, do you think like designing, because we all know the history of your childhood, do you think you're designing this kind of uh, you know, architecture is a way of not only your face, but also release your past? You know, when I see, for example, when I see like controversial Dresden Military Museum, to me it's like, you know, it's sometimes in a way it reminds me of Tchaikovsky, you know, you, 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 you need that break on something sweet. Do you think there's something like that? Thank you very much. Thank you for the questions. Uh, well, when you talk about the Dresden Military History Museum, uh, which is an, uh, an old armory which I restored, it was always a military museum of Germany, the biggest, actually it's the biggest museum in Germany by far. Uh, it was the German Museum, the, Dr the Saxon Museum, Nazi Museum, Soviet Museum, East German Museum, and now, of course, the Bundeswehr, the army, the German army, wanted to know what to do with this museum. Well, I did cut it very deliberately. It's a very deliberate disconnection from, uh, I also restored the armory, but I wanted to, to show that between 1914 and 1945, a huge disconnection in Germany happened, and a catastrophe in the world from Germany. And I inserted this wedge, which points towards the view of Dresden, but also points to the triangular places, triangulation, because the form is triangular, from which Dresden was bombed in that fateful Allied bombings which leveled the city. So it's true. Sometimes a, a, a project is not just about making an extension to a building or a design element. It has to do with what you want to say. A building should say something. A building that doesn't make a point is to me not a building. A building that doesn't ask a question. Think about it. In philosophy, in literature, in poetry, in cinema, in economics, in science, in biochemistry, questions are of the greatest essence, is to ask a question. Now, what about questions in architecture? 
Architects seem to be giving answers, but shouldn't a building, shouldn't even a city raise a question mark? I think the great cities raise a question. The great buildings, to me, raise a question forever, like a great piece of fugue by Bach raises a question about the coherent uh, unity of time and world. So yes, I'm an advocate that a building should not affirm all one's beliefs, that a building should not uh, anodize one's emotions. A building should, should startle you sometimes, should upset you, should make you feel, is this really a museum? Is this what I came to a museum for? Is this really a military history museum? Is this really a neighborhood I want to be in? I think that's a good thing. And I think uh, as young designers, architects here, I highly recommend that questioning be put into the work, not just answers. It's easy to answer. They're all cliches and marketing gimmicks uh, of gurus that tell you that business is the most important thing. But the material world is not the most important thing. The most important thing is the spiritual sense of people. And who are people? They're not themselves. There's, there's more to the human spirit than, a, than meets the eye. There is the invisible spirit, too, which, which haunts us from the past and from the future. So yes, uh, to answer your question uh, about music now, about my own background, I have to tell you that I didn't, you know, I, 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 perhaps I would have never been an architect had I been able to play the instrument I wanted to play, which was the piano. But I mentioned I was born in Poland uh, during a time of great antisemitism. And my parents were simply scared to bring a piano because they were scared of our neighbors. You know, here are the Jews bringing the piano to the courtyard. They thought this was not a good thing to do. So they got me a piano and a suitcase called the accordion. Well, I did become a virtuoso on that instrument. Uh, I played classical music only. I never played uh, popular music, maybe the chardash once in a while for the Hungarians. Uh, but uh, the instrument taught me many, many things. And, and when I discussed with Isaac Stern, who was, uh, you know, who was the head of the jury, uh, that gave me the prize together with Isaac Perlman. Daniel Berenboim was another winner of that prize. Uh, when I discussed it with him, he said, you know, Mr. Liebeskind, you've been on the vertical very long time. Now it's time for you to go to the horizontal. But you know, I continued in the vertical in another profession. And yet, well, all I can tell you is that music is not something that I've given up. Because I think every drawing, every building, is a piece of music. It really is. First of all, it's acoustically. You know, in this auditorium, we should not even have, have a speak. You know, we should be able to communicate this number of people without any additional electricity. There should be, acoustics are very important, maybe more important than the, than the visual sense. Uh, so music, from the sense of balance in the inner ear, which is more than the eye, to, to the sense that music is, the connection between proportions, orientation, and a sound that we cannot hear. And that's the sound that Beethoven said drives the world. He says the sound that we cannot hear is the sound that is the sound I'm trying to reach. So music is not a metaphor of, of the Greeks about the lengths, just the lengths of strings, which are exactly in the same proportion as the lengths of the golden section. But music is a greater uh, a greater symbol because music itself is invisible. You can't see music. And yet music communicates not to the mind. It's got a lot of geometry, a lot of precision, a lot of signs. Every note has to be just where it is. But at the end, if the music doesn't come to your soul, it was just a technical performance. There was no music in it. You can play every note correctly and have no music. While, like Arthur Rubinstein or Richter or Horowitz, you can play the wrong notes create the music. So yes, to me, that's the most important thing, is, is music. And uh, I think Vitruvius, the old architect, the old Roman architect, the oldest text that we have from the Roman times on, on what is architecture, said an architect should do two things. And I think he was right. An architect should know how to draw and should be able to play music. <laughs> so it's what, nothing new. <laughs> what a wonderful piece of sharing. <laughs> yes. Mike, over there, please. I want to say that it's a, a great emotion to, to be here and to be listening to you, Mr. Daniel Libeskin. 
Uh, I'm a student of architecture, and uh, you are one of the architects that really gives a lot of inspiration to Thank us. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Uh, I want to ask you something that uh, I listen sometimes architects like Peter Eisenman criticizing like the work of Mr. Calatrava because he's a little bit sculptoric, and I see in your work is also a little bit about uh, scul sculptures. And uh, I want to know what, what is your opinion about that, because uh, sometimes we are confronted about the, the functionality of architecture and so on, and we see some architects that they're really inspired by nature and they really uh, make the buildings more in a kind of a sculpture. And I would like to know your opinion about that. Okay, can I ask the lady to ask the last question as before your answer? Please. Yeah. Hi. Um, I was just wondering, um, as a, someone who has been living in New York before, but after the 9-11, um, I wanted to ask you, as someone who is living and working there now, I don't know if you, if you lived there at the time of 9-11, but I was just wondering if uh, you think 9-11 has changed the city, in what way does, did this have any impact on architecture or urbanism? Could you speak a little bit more about this? Thank you. I'll, I'll start with uh, answering your question. 9-11 uh, didn't change just uh, New York. It's changed the world. We live in a different world, uh, you know, both for good and for bad after these attacks on New York. We think of spaces differently, but I think the primary change was, to me, public involvement. It was the first time in the history of New York where plans presented by the Port Authority of New York Plans of planners, well done, completely regular plans, ready to be built, were rejected by a mass protest of the public. Is this the first time, and we're talking not about a building, we're talking about a master plan. Usually public is not interested in master plans. Public is too busy with their lives to, to care about street widths, conditions of neighborhoods, building heights, arrangements of massing, green space, traffic, infrastructure. First time. In New York's history, the public, general public arose in protest against planners. I think that was a big call to the world, and I think it changed New York's uh, procedures. There is no developer today in New York who can just, just do another set of buildings. There's a big project on the West Side Highway. There's a new big project in Brooklyn. Public is involved. I don't say that developers don't have power. I don't have to say that capitalism has no power. But public has become engaged and has the power to steer reality in terms of planning. And I think that's one of the most positive senses of what Ground Zero really did. Because without going further into it, I want to tell you that there was no competition for Ground Zero. There was just a series of inquiries from well-known architects to, do, to give advice to the Port Authority. The fact that my project was selected and called, quote, a winner of a competition was completely against the grain of what the public authorities were going to do. They had to respond to the public pressure and had to steer the project, sometimes against their own better will, towards something really different, new, something about public space, less about developers, less about private capital, and more about the social good. So yes, in that sense, I think the world has changed. I see the differences all over the world, whether I'm building in Korea, where I had meetings with those people who lived on those blocks. You know, they were against the project initially. And the developer was very scared to propose a new project because these neighbors didn't want to move out of their buildings. They have a perfect view. They've got beautiful apartments. Why do they want to get out of there? But you can, with architecture, and again, I think of the Oscar Niemeyer, create a better city for the society as a whole. So that's just the answer about New York, and uh, I think New York is definitely improving. Uh, of course, the God of New York, as we all know, since Louis Sullivan said it in 1900, the God of New York has always been the God of money. Uh, and maybe that's the God of Hong Kong as well. But the truth is that that God is receding. There are other gods coming to replace that one singular thought, and there's more interest in planning, more interest in the quality of a city, in a sustainability of city, and we saw with, with the storms that people are now outraged that government of the United States, of New York City, did not plan and foresee that the global world is changing, the climate is changing the world. Uh, one can no longer afford to sit back 
and just sell real estate and think that's enough to develop a city. Now to the young man who asked the question about sculpture and Peter Eisenman. Uh, Peter Eisenman is a, a very, very smart person. Uh, and Calatrava is a very good engineer and architect. So the point is that architecture is very interesting because uh, it's a little bit for theorists like a card game where people put stakes on certain styles. They put stakes on certain futures. But to me, architecture is not a game. Either you do something which you truly believe in or the game will be over pretty soon. And I think of all the ideologies of architecture that we have seen through the 20th century, all the isms, there were so many isms uh, that really were nullified because people are smarter than the ideologies. So uh, just to make a last statement, we are, I think, not living in an ideological era. We are living in an, but that doesn't mean it's an era without values. It doesn't mean it's an era without dreams. It doesn't mean that it's an era where we don't have to fight for what we believe. Thank you. Thank you. A big hand to Thank Daniel, you. and he has really created his Thank music you. for Thank architecture. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.